Then I'll enjoy my life for the Breeze. Fair and for 51. In a futuristic society in the United States, the Montard is a firefighter who starts fires to burn books in the houses where they are found, as they are forbidden. He wears a black uniform and a helmet with the number for 51, the temperature at which paper burns. One afternoon after work and on his way home, he runs into Clarice McClellan, his near 17-year-old neighbor. If she asks him if he knows the history of his profession, the firefighters used to put out fires instead of starting them. Hunter doesn't believe Clarice. He replies that firemen have always had the task of destroying books, that it is impossible for houses to catch fire suddenly because they have always been built with fire-resistant materials. After muting Clarice, Hunter returns home to find his wife Mildred, <gasps> unconscious on the floor, from an overdose of tranquilizers and sleeping pills. Instead of doctors, the hospital workers pump her stomach, and the next day his wife doesn't remember anything about what happened. Lunter tried to talk to Mildred about why she took the pills, but she doesn't want to discuss it, and tries to change the subject. Uninterested, Lunter heads off to work, and outside the house he finds Clarice in the rain, catching the rocks with her mouth open. The girl explains that he is not like the rest of the firemen, that he is willing to talk to her and listen to what she has to say. Lunter responds, telling her that she must attend her appointment with the psychiatrist, which the government requires because of her lack of sociability and possible tendency to independent thinking. Once he gets to the firehouse, Lunter approaches the mechanical hound. <laughs> the robotic police dog who is tasked is to track down and destroy anyone who disobeys the laws of society. The hound runs at Lunter, leaving him nervous about his behavior towards him. Clarice and Lunter meet every day of the next week. Clarice asks him why he and Mildred never had children. And when he asks her why she's not at school, Clarice answers that she stopped going because it's useless and routine. But on the eighth day, Clarice doesn't show up. At the fire station, the alarm blows off, and they head for an old house, which hides books in the attic. They send an old woman aside to get to the books. Then when one falls into the hands of Monterg, he hides it under his uniform. Yet the old lady refuses to leave the house. Though when firemen cover books with kerosene, it lights a match and stays inside the house, while everything around her burns. Monterg comes home and hides the book he stole that afternoon under his pillow. While he's resting, he realizes that neither he nor Mildred are able to remember where and how they met ten years ago. He starts thinking about his marriage and the time his wife spends on technology. He then asks her about Clarice, who he hasn't seen in days, and Mildred tells him she was hit by a car and the family moved out of the house after the incident. The next morning, Montred wakes up sick and unable to go to work. His bus captain, Beattie, hears about Montred's condition and decides to pay a visit to see how he's doing. Diddy tells him about the evolution of society and how the banning of books came about because of the independent thoughts they provoked in people. During Captain Beattie's visit, Miller gets anxious and without thinking, starts siding up the room. She tries to arrange Monter's pillow, but he won't let her do it. She still slips her hand under the pillow and when she finds the book, she's scared. <gasps> Monter asks Beattie how a person like Clarice could exist. Beattie replies that the government has been watching the McClellan family for some time that her behavior was dangerous, and that Clarice was better off dead. Lunter also asks what would happen if a fireman stole a book and took it home. The captain replies that curiosity can overcome the firefighters, and that in such cases they have 24 hours to return it or burn it. Otherwise, the rest of the fire team will have to do it. Once Billy leaves the house, Lunter panics and tells Mildred a secret. He takes her to an air duct in the house, and when he opens it, he shows her the collection of books he had hidden. This is on burning them, but he asks her to let him look at them at least once. In their discussion, they hear someone knocking on the door, making them nervous. They ignore the person at the door, and after a while they are gone, leaving them alone. Mildred starts complaining to Monter, while he opens one of the books, and starts reading. Monter and Mildred spend the rest of the day reading in the house. While reading, Monter remembers Clary several times, until the couple is surprised by a hound scratching at the door. Mildred doesn't care, and after a while the hound leaves. The phone rings and Mildred is distracted by a conversation about a TV show. Meanwhile, you know, Montreux wonders what the next step is. He remembers a meeting he had a year ago with an old man named Faber, who was a former university professor of literature. He found him in a park, and although he had noticed that the professor was hiding a book under his coat, he did nothing about it. And Faber gave him his phone number. Montreux now calls the professor 
and the first thing he asks is how many copies of the Bible he still has left. The professor astonished thinks Monteru is trying to capture him, so he tells him there's no copy left and ends the call. Reviewing his book collection, Monteru realizes that the book he stole from the old woman's house may be the last copy of the Bible in existence. He thinks about giving Beatty a different book, but is afraid that if Beatty knows what book he has, seeing a different one he will know about his collection. Mildred warns him that a group of friends will be coming to the house to watch TV with her, and Mondrup heads to Faber's house. When Mondrup arrives, he shows Faber the book and asks him to help him understand what is written. Faber explains that what society needs is quality information found in books, time to analyze it and freedom to act on what they learn from it. Mondrup suggests that Faber hide books in the fire station and set off the alarm to discredit their reputation. But Faber insists that this would not solve the central problem that it's best to hope that the war ends today's society, but that they can form a new society out of it. Nanto responds to Faber's cowardice by tearing out pages of the Bible until the teacher agrees to help him. Faber gives him a radio from Nanto to put in his ear and hear Faber's instructions on how to act in front of Beatty. Nanto decides to take the risk of giving the captain a book other than the Bible. Back home, the mother's friends, Mrs. Phelps and Mrs. Bowles, arrive to watch TV with her. But Nanto turns off the TV walls and prepares to talk to them. He gets angry when they start talking about politics and finds out in the last election they voted for the current president, only because he was better looking than the other candidates. Then Mantra decides to show them a book of poetry. They protest and Faber can hear through the radio in his ear. Mildred quickly responds to their protest by saying that every firefighter is allowed to take a book home for a day to discover how absurd they are. Mantra starts reading a poem. But when he has done, Mrs. Phelps can't stop crying, and Mrs. Bowles gets mad at him for causing a fuss. Blunter tosses the book in a fire at Faber's request. Once Mildred's friends leave, Blunter heads to the kitchen to check out his book collection. When he notices that some have disappeared, he discovers that his wife has been burning them. So he picks up what's left and hides them in his backyard in the garden. He goes to the fire station, and as he enters, Faber asks him to act normal and stay relaxed. He gives the book to Beauty and he guesses it in the trash, without even looking at the title. The captain tries to scare him by reciting literary quotes, in an attempt to confuse him and convince him that books are better burned. Faber, in the meantime, advises him to stay calm. Monterg is nervous and afraid of making a mistake and being discovered, to which Faber responds that mistakes sharpen the mind, and therefore one should not be afraid of them. Suddenly the alarm goes off in the firehouse. The team gets ready, and after looking at the address of the alarm, Beatty gets behind the wheel of the fire engine, but upon arrival, Monterv looks up and discovers that the place they must burn is his own house. Monterv has been stunned by the situation, at which point he sees Mildred rushing out of the house with a suitcase and into a taxi. Monterv understands that she was the one who ratted him out and raised the alarm. On the other hand, Vidi intimidates Monterv and asks him why he didn't deliver the books when the hound knocked on his door earlier. Plus, Vidi tells him there's no point in him trying to escape because the hound will be watching. Then he orders Monterv to burn the house down himself destroying every room with the flamethrower. Monter obeys, he burns everything he owns, and Beatty arrests him when it's done. Beatty sees that Monter is hearing something in his ear, and he hits him on the head, taking away his radio, and cutting off his communication with Faber. Beatty promises to track the person on the other side. Then Monter opens the flamethrower, and burns Beatty to death. Immediately, the hound appears, and attacks Monter, sticking a needle in his leg, and injecting cocaine. Monter manages to destroy it with the flamethrower, and runs away with intense of pain. In the garden he finds for the books he had hidden. On the radio he hears the police alerts, warning of his search, and goes to Faber's house. On the way he's almost hit by a car speeding to the him. Monterg thought it was a police car, but finds out it was really a group of young kids, speeding around for fun. Before arriving at Faber's house, he stops at a fellow firefighter's house. He hides the books he carries, and from a phone booth raises the alarm. At Faber's house, Monterg tells him what happened. Faber tells him to follow the train tracks, in search of the camps that shelter persecuted intellectuals. On the TV, the news reports that a new hound has been sent in search of the firemen. Monterey asks Faber for dirty clothes, and orders him to get rid of all traces and odors he has left in the house. Monterey escapes from a hound's chase by looking out the windows of the houses and the TV screens. He was heading towards the river to get to the train tracks, when he hears on the radio a notice asking residents to look out their windows and look for him. When he gets to the river, he puts on Faber's dirty clothes and goes into the water, letting himself be carried away by the current. He finally arrives at the riverbank, meets the train tracks, and begins to follow the path. 
This brings him to a campfire with five men sitting around. The group's leader, Granger, calls Mondra by name. He invites him to sit with them and offers him a cup of coffee. Granger reveals the portable TV they have been following the chase with and informs him that they were waiting for his arrival. Mondra is surprised that all of the group is made up of vagrants. They all look clean and tidy. Granger then gives him a bottle of bitter liquid that will change his chemical composition and prevent the hound from finding him. The men sit and watch TV together. A lonely man appears on the screen walking down the street, smoking a cigar, and the announcer identifies him as Montrick, at which point the hound appears and attacks him, leaving him dead. Granger introduces Montrick to the rest of the group. Montrick realizes that they are all former intellectual professors. Granger tells him about the system they have adapted, where each of them has memorized the literary work they have read before, and explains there are more groups like them across the country, waiting for the moment when it's safe to print books again. Montrick walks with the rest of the group during the night, Suddenly, enemy planes drop bombs on the city. The group falls to the ground. For a moment, Montag thinks of Mildred, dead in the rubble, and remembers that he met her in the city of Chicago. Once the impact passes, the group gets up and cooks breakfast. Granger compares society to a phoenix, which dies and is reborn from its own ashes. Finally, he admits that he hopes that society will learn from history and stop destroying itself. With this, he leads the group back to the city to start the rebirth of the society. And here ends the summary of Fahrenheit for 51. Leave us in the comments what other summaries you want to see. And subscribe so you don't miss them. Until the next video.